Okay, I had a, a question related to, I guess, appropriations. Uh, it's, it's so obvious on probation and parole, if those two need to be functioning correctly, if anything goes wrong on either side, the population in the prison goes up. And so when we're, uh, when finance, uh, when the appropriations bill goes through, do we uh, allocate those separately, probation, or is probation actually a decision by TDCJ board as to how much money they get? <clears throat> in the uh, in the appropriate in TDCJ's appropriations pattern, uh, community supervision is a different <coughs> strategy. It's a separate strategy. So the legislature makes the decision about how much money to allocate towards probation funding to CSCDs through grants and formula funding in a separate strategy than the incarceration strategy, which is a separate strategy from okay. uh, so, so, so finance all and appropriation mm -hmm. and out do consider those separately. And it's not just a decision of TDCJ. That's correct. Okay. The TDCJ director makes the request. <laughs> okay. Who makes the presentation and decides which categories to get what amount? The well, director of TDCJ. Mr. Livingston, I believe, yes, makes that presentation. The, the LAR comes from the board. So what I'm saying is he first obviously has to take care of the institutional division because that's your major requirement is to run safe and secure prisons. So if we're making budget cuts, we normally always go to either probation or parole because you just can't cut correction officers or feeding your prisoners, but you do can cut the programming. Would that be a fair analysis? But Generally, the only thing yes, is they I don't come so, in there yes. separately. You don't have the probation director come in. You don't have parole come in and make a request. It's it's out of headquarters, and, and Brad Livingston and his fiscal people talking to operations as to how we're going to allocate the funds. And one of the downsides you talk about merging it into an umbra umbrella agency is the institutional division gets first call on resources because you got 158,000 inmates that you sure as hell can't do nothing with. But you, in terms of caseload for parole or probation, can be allowed to increase. Yeah, I'm only so, only so my they're not done separately. They're done largely by the prison system. <coughs> but there are separate categories approved by sure. the legislature. But right. they've done a great job. They've done a great they've, job. They've done a great job of saying it will have to have more <laughs> prison money if you don't fund the probation and the parole I can, I can tell he's worked on this a long time. The, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> If it's separate, that if we do end up as a legislature shorting probation sure. or shorting payroll, then the middle population can increase and it's going to be couldn't say it any better. Any more. Well, I had a question so about that. 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 Thank you. So, if I understand the discussion that just had, the amount of money that parole has is dictated by the institution of the division. The director, the, by the director. The, we have one person, Buck Stops with Brad Livingston, who happens to have a physical LVB background, which is good. But he could be down here and explain probably better than I. He gets input from all of his department heads, the four different categories. And all I'm saying is, realistically, is you've got to fund your institutional division adequately because there's right. no shortcomings there, although. I would suggest sometime we need more correction officers instead of one at the back gate. You probably need two with those budget cuts that have been made. But historically, you will cut the parole and probation. The great news is the last two budget cycles, because everyone is understood as Robert just explained, what happens on the front end affects the back end. If you, if you don't adequately fund probation, you will revoke more. And they'll go to prison. If you don't handle parolees more adequately, lower caseload, keep them on the streets, they'll end back in prison. So it's a finely tuned system that really most people say is working pretty darn good right now. Well, that's what, I guess that's what I was getting at. It, it seems like there are a lot of moving parts. It's a system. And, and yet we just had a discussion about a, a standard that ought to be used to parole. Well, that's, that belies the whole... Moving Good point. The, the the the, the uh, parole considerations. The uh, what the hell do you call it? The uh, you were asking about John. The uh, guidelines. Ma'am. Guidelines. Well, guidelines. The guidelines. Right. Part of that was to make certain that you always have adequate facilities, and if you don't handle the guidelines properly, it'll <coughs> go up at the front end and the tail end. And, 
And right now, things are cooking along pretty smooth. Well, that's what I guess I'm getting at, Senator. But to measure it against the guidelines and to say that you're not using the guidelines could impact the rest of the system. Is not. Well, yeah, but I think you're looking at it from the wrong end because to the extent that that TDCJ dictated how much money you're going to have in parole influenced their ability to do parole. You're right. And so as a consequence, you know, the guidelines may be influenced by the fact that they didn't put enough money in parole. Hey, no question. So that it's not a matter of looking just at the guidelines. I guess They're not autonomous. They, right. they got to they fit you together. You got to fit together, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, if there are not any more questions, which it doesn't appear there are, um, I'd like to bring up, if, if y'all are ready, Mr. Livingston and um, Mr. Bell. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Thank y'all. Good job. Thank you.